Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Nick Johnson. Nick is an international best-selling author, award-winning keynote speaker, and executive mental health advocate. He is the founder and managing director of Executives Global Network Singapore, Asia's largest executive peer networking organization. He is the author of a new book called Executive Loneliness, The Five Pathways to Overcoming Isolation, Stress, Anxiety, and Depression in the Modern Business World. And I am excited to have him on the show to talk about mental wellness for leaders. So Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, John. Um, and, and I really am looking forward to this conversation. Yes, I am as well. This is one that we really haven't covered in, in a lot of detail. And as a CEO myself, as someone who's been in senior management for most of my career, I understand that it's lonely at the top. So this is going to be an interesting discussion and I'm looking forward to it. So um, That's good. let's just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us, uh, uh, you know, what journey did you take to end up you know, starting a peer networking group in Asia, uh, of being that you're from Sweden. So <laughs> give us a little bit of your, 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 your history and how you ended up where you're at. Well, John, back home in Sweden, I was a bit of a rebel, I guess. And I was, you know, looking at where can I go after my studies uh, somewhere far away. And I looked at a map in Australia, I looked pretty far away. So I traveled there and I, I did my university in Australia. Uh, after a few years there, though, I realized that it was pretty far away from home. So then I looked at a map again and uh, Southeast Asia was halfway. So I thought that'd be a good stop. Uh, I took up a job in, in Thailand. And after that, I worked now actually 18 years in Thailand, Indonesia, Vietnam. And the last of these are five years in Singapore. And uh, to add to this, I, I started in advertising, but worked my way up in uh, general management in the end, basically leading quite large organizations in the medical industry. Uh, I was managing 72 hospitals and clinics and medevacs from a lot of the uh, the gold uh, the gold mining sites and also the oil platforms and so on in Indonesia in my last corporate role. Oh wow! So you had a lot, you had a variety of experiences. And when did you sort of have develop a passion for this idea of mental wellness for leaders? Well, I learned it the hard way, John, and okay. I think uh, perhaps as many of us men do, you know, uh, we have an. We, we have perhaps a, a journey and uh, in my case it came when I was 40 years of age I was wondering you know what am I doing in the job am I happy I was looking at my relationship uh, with my wife was I happy was I happy with myself and there was a lot of unhappiness and I resigned from my job divorced my wife and before I knew it I was sitting there basically too lonely and my friend became instead a, a bottle of beer after work that became a bad habit and that was a slippy slope and uh, with that, basically, I had a two, three year crisis and and eventually I managed to recover. Uh, but as I'm looking back at my career, you know, it was too much elbowing myself to the top. I wanted to get the packages. I wanted the promotions. I wanted to hit the bonuses. And all I cared about was, you know, impressing the bosses. I was stepping on the toes of my colleagues and I wasn't perhaps the best leader. So looking at my journey, you know, and, and how what I went through, I thought that this is a story that I need to share because uh, I think many leaders are like me and I call myself an anxious overachiever and that was mm -hmm. what propelled me to the top. Mm, interesting. Well, we're going we're gonna to unpack that in this discussion, uh, but that's really interesting and it's not unusual. I mean, I, I, I work for three global companies. I know that, you know, elbowing your way to the top, I know what that's, that's like and you're right. It can be, uh, you can give you're all to the to the company at you know at the detriment to your your personal relationships and that's a that's a big problem a big concern for leaders as they're working their way up especially young leaders coming in a big company working their way up and then they sacrifice everything for that next rung on the ladder and then they end up having challenges you know they have problems so we're going to unpack that in a little bit but tell us about the uh the executives global network that you have in Singapore what is it and what do you guys do there yeah, so I was approached by them uh, about six, seven years ago. And at the time, then they, they told me about the network they set up in uh, Europe uh, about 30 years ago, and they wanted to expand to Southeast Asia. So I then took up the assignment to help them in Singapore. And I immediately fell in love with the business model because there was this safe space in the mm -hmm. confidential peer groups where senior executives, just like myself, who's been in those roles, could discuss all these challenges. 
so as I was looking back at myself when I had the roles, I didn't dare to share my challenges with my team. I didn't share the big issues that I perhaps kept me awake at night with uh, my boss because I thought that's what they pay me to do. Uh, my friends who I went to drink beer with and watching sports on TV, we shared a good moment, but I didn't share my challenges. I also was wondering maybe they won't understand. So there I was, you know, keeping all these big challenges to myself. But inside these peer groups now, exactly that's what we facilitate with. So you bring in your challenges and we have moderated than to help you discuss it and suddenly you have that you know sympathy by being surrounded by someone else so you would have uh, you know no competitors there everyone signed an NDA so in that sense you feel that this is your private advisory board it's your safe space where you get support mm, that's fantastic what are what are some benefits that leaders who engage in this sort of confidential peer network what are some um, what are some benefits that they get from doing that well, in a nutshell, you are training yourself to become more vulnerable because first you then open up in this safe, safe space and you suddenly understand, wow, as soon as I share my challenges, there's actually people who have been there before who can help me. So that loneliness, that isolation feeling is leaving you. And also a lot of the resentments with the team, because many times, especially here in Asia, a, a re typical regional director, you might be, you know, running 15, 20 countries and they're different languages, cultures, and you cannot manage them all in the same way. Uh, so you would always have perhaps conflicts, issues in some markets and then getting the support and how to crack the code for these countries uh, by being part of a peer network is just wonderful. Because I've seen so many leaders who, who've been crashing because they simply just cannot figure out the code and no one really can. The issue is when you sit on it yourself and when you don't ask for help, that's when you really, really can suffer from loneliness. Mm, yeah, I agree. I was involved with um, a peer group here in the States. It was for veteran entrepreneurs, so uh, military veterans uh, who are who started companies and just having that, you know, regular dialogue with my peers, basically people who are in the same position as me, you know, having the same struggles uh, was really, it, it was helpful for me to get through those first three or four years of starting my, you know, getting my company off the ground, knowing that others had, were, had been in my shoes before. And uh, just, you know, just having a, a confidential place where you could talk to others, because I think sometimes, as you say, you, you it's lonely at the top, you, 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 there's loneliness as being the boss. And so a lot of times there's no one to talk to, you know, you don't want to talk to your employees necessarily. You don't want to talk to maybe investors. Uh, you don't want to talk to customers. So who are you going to talk to, right? Your spouse possibly, but uh, to be able to talk to to peers that are going through what you're going through, that is powerful. Yes, absolutely. And and I mean, we were running these peer groups leading up to the pandemic for senior executives. Uh, but what happened during the lockdowns then? We had entrepreneurs coming to us, business owners asking, I also need someone to talk to. I'm sitting here working remotely from home. Yeah. My company is in crisis mode. I also feel isolated. And we quickly set up peer groups for business owners then. And we have more than 100 business owners now divided in three peer groups here in Singapore as well. And we're setting up these in the other markets as well, Malaysia and Indonesia. I'm actually flying to Malaysia uh, today. Uh, and so these are booming over there as well because uh, we quickly realized that you know the, the business owners indeed have challenges and why not support each other as well rather than compete with each other no i love it i love it and i think it's really powerful and you know th those are people are listening in and 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 if you're struggling with loneliness the peer peer groups are a great place to be able to have that uh to be able to share those challenges that you face and so that's uh that's great that you offer that and uh there's there's definitely certain ones in the us i encourage leaders to take a look at themselves because this is really powerful. So you wrote a book about executive loneliness. So uh, you told a little bit about your story. Why did you? Why else did you write a book about executive loneliness? Why was this the subject you chose? Well, I was blessed to go through my crisis and come back uh, stronger. But sadly, in 2019, there was a friend of mine, someone I had done some work with, who didn't make it through, and he died of suicide. And uh, that was a big eye opener for me because we, I thought they had it all going for him. He had just been to the Mount Everest base camp. He was sharing on social media that he never was happier. He had a girlfriend he loved, uh, he did a good job. And we did some work he was going to do a presentation for uh, uh, in, at one of our events. 
suddenly he was gone and I had a lot of questions. I spoke with his family and we still couldn't figure out what happened. Uh, so I realized then by looking back at myself, while I had a crash, but I managed to come back, I realized that if I would have continued to go down, I could have ended up like him. And so many, uh, and in this case, I was looking at men from the start, so many men had gone down that path and it's starting by loneliness and it's then not speaking up, not feeling understood. And that's why I decided to then survey this. And what I did, John, was I put down a survey to senior executives then uh, asking about loneliness, stress, stress, depression, and mainly looking at, will you ask for help if you are suffering? Uh, will you talk to your company about it? And that inspired me. The findings of this was the foundation for the book. Mm, interesting. And, and, and as a part of that finding, did, did you find that in general that we don't as leaders reach out to others when we're struggling well uh for a start uh, i mean the, the survey was in 2019 so before the pandemic uh, and the findings was that about 30 percent were suffering from loneliness uh, from mm -hmm. time to time in the workplace i did the same survey in 2020 during the pandemic and the numbers have doubled that's oh, wow. not a big surprise of course yeah. but uh, we are working remotely company in crisis mode so yes it has increased uh, the question then is uh, the next one was uh, will you talk to someone in your company and 84 percent said no they will not mm. tell anyone about this and then a follow-up question okay will you seek professional help 75 percent say no mm. so we so in general as leaders we we do suffer from loneliness 30 percent pre-pandemic 60 percent in the pandemic and then in general a vast majority we don't do anything about it we don't seek professional help we don't we don't even reach out to others we just internalize it Absolutely. We sold your own. That's what we've been told uh, as children, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And, and what are, what are the, I mean, aside from the story of your friend with suicide, what are the other effects when we are facing loneliness, uh, depression, stress, anxiety, and we don't do anything about it? What, what are some of the effects that we, that, that happen to us when, when that stuff is piling on? Well, I also did uh, in-depth interviews of a lot of executives, which are included in my book and uh, some anonymous, while some want, some people actually were okay to step forward and even mention the name. Uh, and it was various uh, stories. And typically people were quite shy the first time they wouldn't expose themselves too much, but it was a couple of instances. Uh, and I remember one in particular, a managing director is a very powerful lady in, in the banking industry. So working in a man's world, uh, and she had made it to the top and she looked like, you know, the perfect example of someone who's had it all, who has it all together from the outside. But when, during the first interview, she didn't reveal much, but a few days later, she sent me a message and asking if we could catch up for a coffee again. And then she opened up to me and she started to cry. She said, uh, Nick, it has gone as far. I even rehearsed my own suicide twice. I don't know what to do. You are the first one I'm sharing this with. Boom. You know, so there I was suddenly hearing this kind of story. And uh, that this has a positive ending, John, because after that, uh, she promised to see a, a counselor and the counselor called in the husband they had a dialogue the three of them and she is uh, actually now taking a sabbatical from her work and she is feeling better than ever just by the fact that she opened up a little bit to me and that is the story john uh, that that is such a beautiful uh, ending to and there was many of these many people came forward and just the fact that we talk about it and they feel that someone is listening that was the breakthrough Mm, interesting. You you mentioned sabbatical, and and I wasn't planning on talking about that, but I you know recently a pastor of the church that I go to, um, our church uh, typically has sabbaticals every three years or so for the pastors to to disappear for six months and uh, and just recharge, refocus, and then come back. And um, and so I was a witness to uh, someone who did that, uh, got a chance to to get away and then come back and. It was powerful to see um, his recovery during that time and coming back, you know, engaged and ready to go and 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 having him had a chance to sort of rest, uh, reflect and rebuild for the future. It's interesting that sabbaticals are not a more common thing in in business leaders, because I see it. You see it in professors, you know, some of the universities, 
you'll see it in religious leaders uh, from time to time, but um, never, you never hear about that in, in the business world, right? Or is that, do you, do you see that in Asia at all or? Well, it's becoming more popular, I would say, during these times. And uh, you asked me what I saw during these times when I interviewed, it was also a lot of burnout, people being hospitalized for mm. various levels of stress. And uh, what I can see now is, is that it's becoming more popular. And uh, what we do in my company, uh, if ever we have a resignation, I first just acknowledge, thank you for um, sending in your resignation. And I try to book a meeting face to face if I can. Uh, for the next week, typically on a Monday. So you give them some space to think about it and you give them the weekend to sleep about it. What I realized then is that m about half of the times they recall the resignation by the, when you have the conversation. And then uh, the first thing I just ask them, you know, would you like some time off? And many times it's one week off, two weeks off and someone, that's all they need. People just need some space, some time. Uh, and so many times it's perhaps that they just feel overwhelmed and it might not be the job in itself they are resigning from. It's, it's the pressure that's been yeah. on their shoulder. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, I absolutely see that. And I saw that in my, throughout my career as well. So it just sometimes people just need a little break, <laughs> a little space and uh, to get refocused and, and recharged. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, so uh, executive loneliness, how do we, how do we avoid it? How do we, you know, what are some signs that we're, we're facing or, or we might see a peer that's facing it or we're facing it? What are some signs that we're kind of coming into this space? Well, the, the way to overcome uh, loneliness is, of course, to be connecting with people and it has to start at the top. We cannot expect the middle manager suddenly going into you know, the office of the boss saying that they're not well, uh, it can have a sabbatical, I'm, I'm facing a burnout. They're not gonna do that unless the boss himself or herself it's also leading by example and putting on the brakes. So back to myself in my organization, sometimes I just say, sorry, I, I'm not feeling too well. I don't have capacity for this now. Can we pause this? Can we reschedule a meeting to next month? I just have enough on my plate now. Is that okay with everyone? And you just as a leader have to show that from time to time because then you're creating this culture that it's okay to not be okay. Uh, and it's about stopping it before it becomes something too serious. And uh, we even also implemented in my company a policy now since we continue working from home remotely, which is a fail fast uh, policy where we almost encourage the team members to make mistakes, grab them when they are very small and share about it in our weekly meetings and sharing what they learned from it. And part of the budgets they are working with is exploration budgets for that very reason that you can pinpoint and put it in that bucket. So there's no blaming from anyone. And that is where I think, you know, we, we need to start addressing it by these kind of things. Hmm, interesting. And signs, uh, what are some signs that you, you might be facing burnout or loneliness or stress or anxiety? What are, what are some signs that we should look out for either for the people working for us or, or our peers, or even ourselves for that matter? Yeah, in my case, it was that I changed my habits. So mm. I used to go for a run after work. Suddenly, I, instead, I went to the bar drinking some beers after work and I lost interest in, in, in things that I loved. And so if, if we're in a relationship, if your wife or husband normally come home every Wednesday and cook pasta and they play the guitar every day for seven years and or a mother is losing interest in, in the young child, you know, if we see these signs, then we we might understand that something have changed, gaining a lot of weight or losing a lot of weight. And the issue is, of course, opening up this conversation, because if you ask someone, they're going to feel that you're confronting them. So there again, back to this, you have to start first. If you approach someone and, and you're building up this relationship and saying that you're a bit under the weather at the moment and you share something that has some meaning, then most likely the person will after that say, oh, by the way, I'm also not feeling great. But we have to start first. So you have to recognize it and you have to have that conversation, you're saying. Yes, absolutely. The best is, of course, to build up this rapport before when things are good, you need to learn to be vulnerable in good times. So then when you're going through challenging times, it's even easier. But if you are reactive and you haven't done that, 
the worst we can do is is approaching our partner saying that I think you are drinking too much or I think uh, you know you are you're gambling too much of our money. People will immediately go into defense mode, right? We need to mm. make sure that we are very careful with that. Interesting. So just based on your personal experience and 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 what you went through, how how do you, how did you build resilience uh to prevent this from happening, uh, you know, in the future. So in my case, it was about learning from what I gone through, really taking this self critical look at myself and then communicating it. So making my weaknesses, my strength. And that's why I'm with you today, John. And that's why I wrote a book about it, because uh, I thought I need to share this. And the first year, basically, I shared it in an an anonymous confidential environment. So I was already gone f- going through my recovery. I was already feeling a lot better when my friend died of suicide, but that changed everything. When, mm. when that happened, I realized I should not keep my recovery journey is something that I need to share for, with other people. And I made a LinkedIn post at the time with a video that went viral and people were suddenly writing from me all around the world. The next thing was, I was live on radio and they were asking me a lot of very personal questions and I was not really ready to share with the world, but I did uh, uh, because I, could, I was taken by surprise. And the next day I was in a four page feature in a big uh, newspaper. So there my story was out. And that's when I thought, well, if it's out there, I might as well write the book about this. Wow. Wow. So uh, tell us about the book, like uh, those people that read the book, what are what are they going to get out of it? Are they going to just get your journey or are you going to get the whole uh, the whole arc as to what to do about it and how to prevent it going forward? What are they going to get through this uh, through reading this book? Well, my story was not part of it from the beginning. It was the publisher who said we need to put some personality ah, here. So we need your story. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and who want to write something as personal as your mental health issues and that I had an alcohol addiction at some times. I mean, even I was shy, even I was talking about it, I was still shy and putting this in a book was a bit too much for me. But I did it and I wrote it and I, I kept uh, giving it to my wife. I got remarried at this stage and she I said, read this again, read this. Is it the complete truth? Because she was by my side. And she keep pushing me and said, Nick, no, you need to reveal this, that. So I edited it until she said, this is exactly what happened. So uh, I still even just talking about it, John, I feel a little bit uncomfortable. But for every time I share it, and someone have read it and telling me that I feel a bit better. And it, then that's how I start to feel connected. Uh, so indeed, my story is there. But I tried to write a summary and I divided it up in five steps, what I saw, what I did to recover. So that's really so it's, you can say that it's a, it's a guidebook for someone who's going through a challenging time, or if they have someone perhaps by their side, who uh, who is going through a difficult time. Mm, interesting. That's, that's fantastic. And I, and I think uh, and I really do think that when you put your own story in there, that people are going to relate. They're going to they're going to see your story. They're going to relate to it better than just a list of here's here's you know here are the signs, here's what to do. But but they see your journey through this whole thing. I think uh, provides. I think we do better when there's stories like that, and we relate to we, we can relate to you as we go through the book, and uh, and that's and that's not easy to do. Like you said, you're. You're you're kind of you know sharing it all with the world, and now everybody knows you, you know knows this very personal story of you. And uh, I know I find with my books, a lot uh, I have people who read my books and they know about me, and I don't know them about them. So they'll say I like you know I I like what this happened this this part of this story, and you're like like how do you know that about me? I, oh that's right, I put that in the book. So you know the people that know very much personal things about you, and and you don't know anything about them when you talk to them. So it's kind of an interesting thing to bear your soul in a book like that. So very, very interesting. So, um, I mean, what, um, you know, what's the feedback been since the book has been out? What, um, what have you heard from people who have read the book? Well, the timing of it for a start was fantastic. It was released in April 2021. So we're Perfect. still in the pandemic, right? And <laughs> so you can imagine how many all hands meeting I was doing on Zoom, you know, every company wanted to have this story because they had people suffering from isolation uh, at home. So it, it was just a blessing. And, uh, and I mean, it went on Amazon, and people bought it. But then people said many executives said they wanted to have the audiobook because they do listening mm. when they do exercise. So it's also 
also on Audible now. And uh, uh, the feedback has been all around the world. People have been writing, reading, and just thanking me for you know trying to break the stigma and talking on a topic that is so difficult. And the most of the letters I have received typically from uh, a father who lost uh, the daughter or the son to suicide or someone who died uh, by a partner who gone by suicide. Um, and, you know, so it's about breaking the stigma before it goes too far. I don't talk much about suicide in the book, but that's ultimately where it's leading to mm -hmm. if we are not addressing this. And, and uh, uh, that those are some of the things that you know the feedback has been really really warm opening and welcoming and i'm actually starting to work on my follow-up book now which is basically the importance of having healthy relationships which would be the next step mm, interesting I, I i was gonna ask you if there was a future book in the in the work sounds like it is um i know that you're a triathlete and i wanted to know how fitness plays into the to dealing with, because I'm also a fitness guy. So I was curious to know how fitness plays in helping uh, alleviate some of those, some of that loneliness, some of that stress, some of that anxiety. Any any thoughts on uh, from that standpoint? Yes, absolutely. And it's quite a big part of my book. And I call it the natural happy pill, actually, uh, exercise in the book. And uh, when I had my crash, I had lost then the appetite for exercise. And I had not done much exercise for one year. I was instead drinking alcohol and it didn't go hand in hand. Uh, so the first thing I did when I, uh, I started my recovery journey was to get a fitness coach, someone who really could mm. hold me accountable. And we started by three kilometer walking to four or five kilometers some basic wow. work. And so really basic. But then I signed up for an Ironman for one year later. And that that really got me focused. And you know, when you exercise for a start, it's, it's obviously you physically, mentally uh, getting brighter and, and more positive about everything. But I, I could taper off. I had some medicine that was given from doctors for my depression, my anxiety, and I had sleeping pills. And over about three months, I could taper off all those medications. Mm -hmm. And that's why I call it the natural happy pill. And now I'm four years without, I don't take any of those pills and that all my anxiety and stress is gone. And I give that to exercise, but also a, a healthy nutrition. Yeah. Powerful. Uh, and that's, an, I'm glad you, you touched on that. Something we talk about a lot in this uh, podcast. So, so health and fitness are a big part of keeping that anxiety and depression, uh, at bay. Um, you know, I, I know for me, I'm, I'm in the gym every morning, I'm more weightlifting, more that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, when, when you're facing heavy lifts and, 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 and trying to do things that are very difficult, um, you're not thinking about work. <laughs> you're thinking about, you know, you're, and I imagine with, with what you're doing with Ironman, you're just thinking about getting the next, getting through the next mile, getting through the next, you know, half mile, right? You're, you're not thinking about work and you're not thinking about your problems. You're thinking about, you know, getting to that next level. And I think that's good for us. I think it helps us keep our, keep, keeps our mind focused on something else. Yes. And, and I mean, in my sport, then there's three different sports and the swim is where I'm struggling the most. And it's a lot of technique that it's almost like dancing. It's like choreography. So when I swim, it's always technique and it's about thinking about that. So of course I can not think or focus about on anything else but the swimming and plus it's like meditation to breathe in that water and then you have the cycling and most of my cycle training i do with different cycling groups for example even with the members of our peer groups but I also one of the mental health recovery groups we have a cycle group here so i use cycling as my social life instead of going to the bar and pub and so on i use cycling then to network and then for the running it's all of my meditation myself getting out into nature so in that aspect you know i'm surrounding myself exercising but also really getting the, the other parts that are important of life ah, i love that that is so powerful really good to hear that so what what message would you give to any of the leaders who might be listening in them that, that to this episode that might be struggling that might be uh, they're, they're hearing us talk about it and they recognize that, you know, they might have a problem. What, what advice would you give them? Well, the, the first chapter in my book is called taking stock. And that is what I would advise anyone to do. Get out a simple pen and paper and write down, you know, write down the things that 
the strong feelings you have uh, the, uh, in, in my case during my crash it was that i was drinking too much al alcohol i had suffered from uh, not exercising i had resigned from my job and i had to address these key things and once you've written it down, think about who can I talk to uh, about this? Is it a friend? Is it a colleague? Is it a coach? Is it a mentor? Is it an anonymous support group? And a lot of this is free, John. That's how I got my support first because the stigma and I thought I don't want to talk to anyone about this. But I found I called one of these anonymous support group and I, it's the best thing I ever did. They supported me right away. And I, now I'm, in, I'm, I'm myself giving back as a volunteer for this organization as well. No, nah, that's so good. So good to hear. That's fantastic. Well, this is this has been a really good conversation. I think you bring out some things that we haven't talked about on this podcast before. These are important issues for leaders. You are vulnerable to these uh, these situations because you're because you, you're somewhat isolated in the top of the company and you sometimes don't have those peers to talk to. Uh, and so you face these uh, challenges that could lead to uh, depression. It can lead to anxiety. It can lead to isolation. And, you know, worst would be suicide or suicidal thoughts and, and worse. So the best, uh, the best thing to do is to take action quickly. And, um, and like you said, take stock figure out how to contact someone that you can talk to about the, the challenge, because uh, you're not alone. If you're, if you're a leader and you're feeling these feelings, I can guarantee you, you're not alone. We have all been there. So uh, uh, this, Nick, this has been really good. How can people find out more about what you do in uh, this new book? Well, John, I'm quite active on LinkedIn, so they can look me up there or just go to Amazon and look up uh, Executive Loneliness. Uh, it's there as a paperback, but also Kindle and uh, the Audible as well. All right, fantastic. And we'll go ahead and put links in the show notes for those resources. Nick, thank you for coming on Deep Leadership. Thank you for sharing your journey. Thank you for writing this book. Very important. And I really appreciate uh, you sharing all of your insight with our listeners. Thank you, John. Well, thanks again. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.